Um, so I'm Kim Kramer, and I'm a staff attorney here at LAF, and I uh, coordinate our ADAPT project, the Advanced Directors and Property Transfers for Seniors, which is this new pro bono project we have. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit more about that in our introduction um, for Tom from CETL, who's going to be getting into the substance of those things. Um, so here today we've got some uh, pro bono attorneys to get trained um, to do this new project with us and some LAF staff people. Um, it's really great to have all of you here. And so I will turn things over to our presenters here for our first session, um, Dan Mayer and Annika Flanick. They are, uh, Dan is a nurse practitioner and Annika is a social worker with Rush Senior Care, um, which is the outpatient clinic for Rush Geriatrics. Um, so they are going to spend about 90 minutes talking to us about capacity and assessing capacity in seniors. Um, we are recording this session today, and for our um, training archive, it's best if we can save the questions for the end. Um, if you've got something burning that you, you think you're going to forget, um, you can jump in, but try to remember to save your questions for the end, um, and we should have some time to get to them. Okay. Okay, like um, uh, like you said, I'm Dan Mayer. Um, Annika's going to start talking in just a few minutes, but I'm going to get things rolling. Um, we're going to start uh, talking about um, what is decisional capacity. I'm sure that I don't need to tell a room full of lawyers uh, what the legal definition of capacity is, but just for review, it's the ability to understand relevant information, to appreciate the situation and its likely consequences, to manipulate information, and to evidence a choice. Um, this is something a little bit more challenging for the healthcare professional to sort of wrap their brain around. But basically what it is is I want to explain something to you. I want you to explain it back to me. I want you to explain the reasoning that you're putting behind this and you're gonna give me what your choice is. It's, it's fairly straightforward um, and healthcare professionals are getting better at actually assessing it, I think, um, as a result of the, tra the ongoing training they've been getting. Um, <coughs> Uh, so when assessing capacity, first things first, you know, can they, oops, can they see, can they hear, uh, can they understand? Um, I spent a lot of time in um, uh, nursing homes in my career, uh, so when somebody goes in for some skilled care or some rehab or something like that, the first thing the family does is they take home the glasses, the hearing aids, and the dentures because they don't want any of that stuff getting lost. So the patient can't hear, they can't see, and they can't eat. And then they call me up a week later and they go, mom's not eating, huh? what's going on? So uh, first things first, can they hear you? Can they see you? Uh, in our clinic, we actually have something called a pocket talker. It's a device you can get uh, on Amazon. They're about 120 bucks. I used to tell people to go to Radio Shack, but that doesn't exist anymore. Uh, it's, a, it's a little device that's got a microphone on it, headphones for the patient or the client, and you just turn it on and speak into the microphone. It's really, really uh, remarkable. It saves me, my voice, so I'm not having to scream at patients or get frustrated at having to repeat myself over and over again because they can't hear me. Um, in a pinch, I have used my stethoscope where I will put the stethoscope in the patient's ear and talk into the bell just so they can understand. So you have to make sure that they're actually able to hear you and that might just be moving them forward a little bit, maybe coming um, from around the desk and sitting right next to them so they can, they can see your, your mouth moving as well as hear you talking. Um, but you definitely need to assess it. Um, we have all gotten pretty good at um, looking like we're paying attention. <laughs> you're at a cocktail party, there's somebody boring talking to you and you're like, you're making like you're paying attention but not really listening to a word that they're saying. That often happens in these situations because they just can't hear you. Um, uh, I, I don't think you necessarily need to pull out a snow and chart and check someone's vision, um, but are they actually looking at you when you're talking or are they looking slightly off to one side because they can't see you? Um, can they understand? Uh, I talk really fast, so people sometimes tell me that I talk faster than they can hear. Um, and so I have to try and um, consciously slow down for uh, some of our clients. Um, if there's a language barrier, uh, that is also a challenge. We try really hard at Rush not to use family members as interpreters, but sometimes we don't have any choice. Um, uh, and I'm sure that uh, you have all experienced having someone who speaks a different language 
you will ask a question, there'll be a five minute conversation, and then the interpreter will go, no. <laughs> well, wait a minute, wait a minute, what happened? So trying to find out if they're actually understanding what you're saying can be really tricky when, it's a, when you're dealing with someone uh, who isn't a professional interpreter and you're having to deal with um, a family member that's doing it. They tend to uh, edit. <laughs> Um, so when you're assessing capacity, always start with a presumption of capacity. Um, I'll tell a story about myself. When I was a fairly new nurse practitioner, I was um, uh, interviewing a, a woman in our clinic. Uh, my boss was in the room next door, and uh, I asked her a question, and there was this really long pause as she tried to reply. She had Parkinson's. And so being the new person that I was, what I did was I started to talk louder and dumber. So how are you feeling? Well, this went on for a couple of minutes before my boss, who was in one of those rolly chairs, swung over into the doorstop or the, the doorway and she said, damn, that woman has a PhD. She's a retired psychologist. She's smarter than you are. And she just wheeled herself back into the other room. And I looked back at the patient and she goes, and I'm not deaf either. <laughs> <laughs> so don't assume that someone doesn't understand. Uh, you want to presume that they do have the capacity to be able to pull this stuff off. And you need to make uh, sure that you're assessing the ability uh, to make the decision, not the decision that they make. Right. If you've got a patient, well, so for in my world, I have a patient, metastatic cancer, in a great deal of pain, really needs to be on hospice, really needs something much more palliative in nature, who's going, no, I want everything full speed ahead. I want you to do absolutely everything, even if it's painful, even if it prolongs my agony, if, if they have the capacity to make that decision, if they can say to, the, say to me, I understand what you're asking and I reject it because this is what I want and I know that these are the consequences, that's perfectly acceptable even though I don't necessarily agree with that decision. It's not the decision that, you know, it's not whether they're making the decision I want them to make, it's whether they can make a decision. Um, recognize and root out ageism. Um, family members are constantly saying, are trying to sort of horn in, right? I have the power of attorney. Yes, and your mother is completely alert and oriented and sitting right next to me, so this is none of your business. And it's not gonna be any of your business until that changes. So they don't necessarily understand that, but they think, well, gee, but mom's 85, so I should be taking over. Not necessarily. Um, ageism can be kind of subtle as well. Um, I do tend to speak in my outdoor voice most of the time at the office because a great deal of my patients are hard of hearing. Uh, but I do actually get uh, those patients who say to me, please stop shouting at me. Right? And I have to remind myself that I, think I can't assume that everyone's hard of hearing. I just start talking. I come from a family of nine. I, talking loudly is just a habit. But you know, I'm often reminded that I need to just bring it back, dial it back a little bit. Um, capacity is task and situation specific. This is not, I have the capacity to make all decisions about everything in my entire life for the rest of my life. This is, do you have the capacity to understand what I am asking you at this moment and in this moment? We have patients who have got diagnoses of dementia of one kind or another that have the capacity to make decisions, right? It all depends on the kind of decision that I'm asking them to make. If I'm asking them to liquidate their assets, it might not be the right question for me to be asking, right? But if someone's saying to me that they don't want to move into a nursing home, what they really would rather do is just simply hire a caregiver and they have the funds to do that in that, in that moment, if they are telling me that in that moment, then that's perfectly acceptable. Now, if I come back an hour later and they don't remember that conversation, the decision they made is still valid. Um, diminished capacity. Um, it's, it's, nothing's black or white in this world. Uh, one of the things that happens in 
in healthcare, we'll get a phone call from a family member who says, you know, mom's acting really squirrely. There's been a change in her mental status. The first thing we think of is does she have a urinary tract infection? All right? So we can treat the urinary tract infection and she gets better. She goes back to her normal baseline cognition. So um, there's a difference between being demented and having delirium. Delirium is an acute process and virtually always reversible. Okay? Delirium, uh, dementia is a, um, uh, a chronic issue that is progressive and not reversible. So you have to figure out what's happening, right? Is this person suffered, the person that's sitting in your office, are they suffering from a cold? Did they just get out of the hospital, right? Did their, the reason they're sitting in front of you because their wife just died? Maybe what you need to do is to readdress this at a different time because they do have a diminished capacity at that moment. That doesn't necessarily mean it's a permanent thing. Um, where are we? Oh, again, don't confuse the, those communication challenges with diminished capacity. Just because they can't hear you doesn't mean they can't make a decision. Um, culture counts uh, a lot. Um, uh, depending on the um, ethnic background of the, of the person that you're talking to, they may very well defer absolutely everything to their son. They simply will not make decisions without talking about it to their son who's next to them. That's okay, as long as that's, that's their choice, as long as there's not undue influence from the son. Um, so you have to be mindful of that as well, and that's kind of, sometimes that's kind of tough to tease out, because very rarely are they going to say, I don't make any decisions without running about my son. <laughs> you got to kind of figure that out yourself. Um, we have a, a fairly large Chinese population in our uh, clinic. They do not answer direct questions. They just don't, even with an interpreter. So you have to have patience, because I will say, uh, where does it hurt? And it's usually something like, well, in 1953, mm -hmm. I was walking down the street, and I tripped, and I hurt my left leg. And then it goes on and on and on until you finally go, and then yesterday I ran into a post and I hit my right leg. It's like, but that was 20 minutes ago. <laughs> All I wanted to know was where it hurts. But you got to sort of let the process go. And it's just dealing with the, the culture that's in front of you. Um, underlying factors, things like grief, like I said, if someone's just some recently lost a loved one, um, that are, they're just not thinking very well. Uh, depression, uh, again, in my world, um, depression is often referred to as pseudo-dementia, right? So what happens when someone's depressed? They can't concentrate, they don't focus, they're really forgetful, they don't make decisions, they're stuck. That looks a lot like dementia when you're 85. So sometimes what we have to do is look to see whether or not they're getting treated for depression before we can start working, worrying about whether they have the capacity to make decisions. Um, health literacy. Health literacy, this is again, this is in my world. Physicians come in, they try really, 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 really hard to speak English. They walk out of the room and I say, do you understand that? And they go, no, I don't understand a single word you said. <laughs> the entire time the physician was in there, they were going, uh-huh. Uh huh? Uh huh? What did you want me to do? Right? Um, and so trying to work hard at making sure that you're speaking in a language uh, at a level that they understand is also a bit of a challenge. Um, and digging deeper, right? Um, patients come into my office all the time, and, and family members are like, I'm kind of worried about mom's um, memory. She seems to be forget a little bit more forgetful. And I start talking and I go, okay, when did you first start noticing this? Oh, geez, even before my dad died. When did your dad die? Oh, 2003. Like, okay. <laughs> so this isn't going on for a really long time. Or what happens is that you've got those couples, right? And then one of them dies and suddenly the deficits for the other, the survivor become really pronounced because they were offsetting each other, they were helping each other out, they were completing each other's sentences and making sure that things got done. Um, and that becomes um, evident really quickly, um, frequently, once a, a spouse has died, or a loved one has died anyway. Um, 
So if you have the opportunity to talk with other family members, um, that's very helpful. Um, okay, so um, assessing cognition, what do we do? There's an entire field of neuropsychology that does huge numbers of batteries of tests um, uh, that are profound in their depth, <laughs> truly. Um, I should have brought one with. Uh, the, the reports that we get from the neuropsychologists run to 10 or 12 pages, where they will actually say, this is what their pre-morbid um, education was and their intelligence level was, and this is what things are now, and this is where we think they can make decisions and where they can't make decisions. Sure, they can manage their day-to-day -day money. They can have money for going to the grocery store and, and you know, buying clothes and all those kinds of things. However, we should leave things like major decisions about money, like selling the house or, or closing their business, to someone else. Um, they can actually identify the different, between the different types of dementia, whether this is a, a dementing process or more of a pseudo-dementia, and their depression or their anxiety needs to be treated before we can actually really get down to brass tacks. Very, very extensive, uh, usually takes hours and hours and hours of testing for someone to go through this. We use it a lot, but hard to figure that out when you're meeting a patient for the first time and you're just trying to find, get um, an idea of what kind of uh, uh, cognitive uh, impairment they have. And so what we do in our clinic is we use three different tools. We use the mini mental state exam, we use the clock drawing, and we use animal naming. And we're going to kind of go through all three of these um, in kind with you just so you have uh, an idea of what they are, what they test, uh, what they look like, um, and how to administer them. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Which one am I doing? Gotcha. Right. What? Yeah, you guys, this should be in your packet. This is the mini mental state exam. I brought out the one that we use in our clinic. Um, Monica's going to talk to you about that for a bit. Sure. So um, we, we do these very frequently in our clinic. Um, and I, I'm going to go over it sort of step by step with you guys just so um, you have an understanding of how to score it properly. Because um, there are a few, a few parts of it that you have to make sure um, you're scoring correctly. It's, a, it's out of 30. Um, and to start, also one thing to be aware of, once you sort of confirm that they can hear you, of course, um, some people get, once you kind of start this exam or this screener, people get very anxious because they know, especially in our clinic, because so many people do come to us because they are having concerns about their memory or they have family members that are concerned about their memory. Um, this causes some anxiety, um, especially if they're struggling with it. Typically people know when they are struggling with it. Um, so certainly be aware of that um, and you can, it's you know, fine to be encouraging. Um, to move people along here. So for orientation, um, you would just start by asking them the date. And any specific part of the date that they omit, you would just prompt individually. So if they tell you um, what month it is, say, you know, what date is it? What day of the week is it? Um, what year is it? And what season is it? Um, and then you can ask individually state, county, city, hospital, or you would say, what is this place, wherever you're asking, um, or whatever you're administering this test. Um, and then what floor are we on? Uh, one thing to also keep in mind, or one thing that I keep in mind, because we um, we have people come in from Wisconsin, from Indiana, from Michigan, they drive over. So if they don't know the county, for example, you can ask them, you know, what county do you live in? That's um, you know fair enough that someone wouldn't necessarily know that they were in Cook County, for example. Um, for registration, um, you can let them know you're going to test their memory. And you let them know I'm going to say these three objects out loud. After I say all three, I want you to repeat them back to me. Um, if they say three back to you, they get the three points for that one. If they don't say all three back to you, you're going to repeat them back again and have them try again. And you're going to do that up to six times because you want them to try to register that because later <coughs> you're going to ask them to recall those. Um, so do ask them six times. If after six times they're still not able to name all three back, you, you do move forward. Um, and, and when you have asked them, you know, may I test your memory, when you say all three, um, ask them, you know, you try to remember these because I'm going to ask you about these again. 
Um, so then you move on to attention and calculation. You would do one or the other, serial sevens or spell world backwards. Um, always start with serial sevens. Some people just refuse to do this. Right. Um, How many people are stressed by, by looking at that and saying, I want you to count backwards by seven? Like half of the people in the room, right? So don't get too hung up on it. Yeah. If someone <laughs> says they don't want to do that one, you move on to spelling world backwards. That's absolutely fine. Um, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about this. We have some slides that look a little bit at education level and how this relates, because um, that's actually really important with this test. Um, a score of you know, 20 for somebody with a PhD is going to be very different for somebody that you know, made, made it to the fifth grade, for example. So that's going to be important. And this is just happens to be one where that would, for example, we see a decent number of patients who, um, who can't read. Right. So to spell world backwards, that would be not possible. And, and it's also perfectly legitimate when you're doing this section is to actually say to them, can you spell the word world? And then if they do, just say, great, can you spell it backwards? Because if they can't spell it forward, they're not going to be able to spell it backwards. Mm -hmm. um, so once you've, uh, so they get one point for each of those that they get correct. Um, and yeah, one point for each of that they get correct in order. Yes. So if they say, D, yes, they get a point. L, they get a point. O, no. R, no. W, no. Mm -hmm. Right? Even though the W is in the right place, they didn't do it sequentially. They didn't do it in order. So the, you stop counting when they miss. OK? okay. Um, so then you come back to those three words. This one for scoring, they just get the one opportunity to say it back. Um, you're not prompting them in any way. So I, um, a few moments ago, I said three objects out loud, and you repeated them back to me. Do you remember any of those words? Order does not matter. So um, however many they're able to repeat back to you, give them the point for those. And a huge number of times they will say, world. <laughs> yeah, this one, this, for at, at least when I'm administering it, this is by far the most missed um, question. And, and, and again, sort of from the social work perspective, this is also where I see people um, start to sort of shift in their seat and get kind of anxious, and it's perfectly appropriate to, to reassure um, so that people can move on, and we actually get an accurate assessment because we don't want someone's anxiety hindering their ability, which, because that's what happens, obviously, when you get anxious, you can't think clearly. So give them a little break, let them take a sip of water, move on. Um, so for language, um, just point out two objects. So uh, pencil, watch, whatever you have handy. Um, point be, to one, point to the other. Be, be realistic. I don't show them my sphygmo manometer. <laughs> I don't like, yes. what is this stethoscope? No, Let's keep it simple. Is this a pen? Is this a watch? Is this a clock? Is this a pad of paper? Something like that. <laughs> um, and then, uh, yeah, um, so move on to the repetition. So an idiomatic expression, um, ask the patient to repeat after you, no ifs, ands, or buts. And make sure that you enunciate that when you, when you say it, because in order for them to get the point, when they repeat it back to you, they, do, they have to have no ifs, ands, or buts. Um, that's, that's necessary to get the actual point. Um, and we can talk a little bit about this later as well. The MMSE is available in, in a number of languages, um, but this is just something to consider. So you wouldn't do this with an interpreter and have the Spanish translator um, translate that because that's... Because um, it's not an idiomatic that expression in... In Spanish. Spanish. So they would do their... So, so the, um, they're translated appropriately in the actual documents to ask an appropriate um, idiom. Uh, for the three-stage command, so you give the three instructions. Take a piece, piece of paper in your right hand, fold the paper in half, then put the paper on the floor, and then you give them the paper. They have to take it in their right hand before they fold it to get that point, um, and then obviously fold it in half, put it on the floor. Um, oftentimes people will fold it in half and say, and, you know, what was the next step? What was I supposed to do next? And you cannot tell them. Um, just try to encourage them. You know, try to remember what I, what I told you to do. And if they can't, you know, move forward, then obviously they don't get the point for that one. Taking the piece of paper in your, you, what I've asked them to do is take the piece of paper in your right hand. I'm not saying you can't use your left hand. All they have to do is, so if she says that to me and I'm left-handed, I'm going to take the piece of paper in my right hand, I'm going to put it in my left hand and fold it. That's perfectly legitimate. Okay? Um, so then, next on to reading. Um, so again, also just make sure that they can, um, 
if they need reading glasses, they have the reading glasses on. Make sure, before I have them do this, I say, can you see that well enough to read that? Also, I don't do this one if somebody, if I know that they cannot read. Um, so have them read it silently and then obey the following. So they have to read it silently. Even if they whisper it you know, very quietly, the whole point is to see if they can read that, follow those instructions to read it silently, um, not do it verbally. So if they whisper it and then close their eyes, they do not get the point for that. Or if they you know, are sort of looking at it and you're assuming they're reading it, but if they never close their eyes, they don't get the point for that. Um, so for writing, um, and again, this is another one for somebody who uh, is, is illiterate. We don't do this one. Um, could have them say, you know, write a short sentence about anything, anything you want. Um, and in order to get the, you know, we're not looking at punctuation or grammar. Um, I went to the store. I ran fast. It can be very simple, basically a subject and a verb. So right, yeah, we're looking at grammar, but we're not looking at spelling, right? It has to yeah. be a sentence. Yeah. You know. Um, and then for copying, again, make sure that they are able to see those two objects, um, and then have them copy. Um, you know, let them know to do their best. If it, we want to make sure that they have the correct number of sides, that the intersection point is correct. You know, if it's tilted slightly, that's okay. Um, if there's you know a tremor, that's okay as long as they're getting those sides and the intersection point correct. Um, it does. This does not have to be absolutely perfect. Um, but it has to and be. I, I reassure patients all the time. I'm like, I, I don't expect you to be an artist or an architect. Just do what you can. So there's each one of them should have five sides. They're intersecting pentagrams. Both of them have to have five sides. The intersection has to have four sides in order for it to be scored. So, um, okay. so the thing about that MMSE is it's always, always, Always score it out of 30. If you have a blind person in front of you that can't read the, the, the they can't read, close your eyes, they can't write the sentence, they can't have a design, score it out of 30. Okay? Mm -hmm. um, I understand a lot of these things are about memory and recall and, and cognition, but what specifically is that drawing supposed to be looking at? What does that tell us if something can So it's actually visual spatial. So. Um, First of all, it's, um, it's can you actually manipulate? Can you actually see something and, and then draw it out? I mean, that's, a, that's kind of a higher level function okay. to be able to do that. Um, that's the thing that's nice about the MMSC. It covers a huge number of domains, right? So it covers things like orientation. Where are you in the world and when are you? It can register. Can you actually take in information? And then can you recall it? Attention and calculation. This is what I want you to do. Can you spell the world backwards? Can you pay attention long enough to count backwards from seven or from 100 by sevens? I get patients all the time who go 93, 86, 93, 100, because they just lose the ability to concentrate and pay attention. So that's the whole point. The 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 recall. I just asked. I specifically asked you to remember this. Can you do that? Right. So that's why there, all the different domains are here. The language. Can you actually? Identify something. Do you have apraxia? Can you just can you look at this and go? It's a refrigerator, because you can't get that word out. Um, um, and repeating after uh, what someone says is they have to process what you're saying, and and then mimic it. It's a fairly simple, straightforward thing to do, but quite challenging if you're demented. Um, the three stage command. The whole point of that is the three stages. Right. I'm going to give you three different things to do. When I when I have patients when I'm talking with family members about um, uh, working with someone with dementia. I tell them it's very important that if they're asking, that if, they're, if they're involving them in a task, it has to be very simple, one step. And I always give this uh, example, I said, so for example, let's say you're making dinner and you want them to help, that's great. But you cannot say to them, why don't you make the salad? Simple, one step, right? No. Go to the refrigerator, pull out the lettuce, pull out the tomatoes, pull out the cucumbers, rip up the lettuce, wash the lettuce, cut up the cucumbers, cut up the tomatoes. Way too complicated. One step. Grab the lettuce. <coughs> wash it in the sink. Right? Yes. So can they, like, spelling the world backwards, would right? it be all right if they took a pencil and wrote it the right way first? So no. They could <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> because anybody could spell it backwards by having it spelled out for them. 
All right, and counting back from 100, could you, after you had 93, 86, could you just write those down to help you keep track of where you were? I think I, if someone actually wanted to try and do that, that would tell me that they have the capacity to, um, to realize that they needed that assistance, right? So, for example, let's talk about the MMSE a bit. I, I use this all the time. The numbers are kind of important, but I need to know what it is that they do and what they don't do, okay? So, if you're a lifelong Chicagoan and you can't tell me you're in Cook County, that's pretty profound. If you ask me right this minute what the date is, I'm gonna do this. <laughs> it's the 24th. <laughs> I did one of these things this morning with a patient. I said, what's the date today? And she goes, the 22nd, the 23rd, it's the 24th. And I went, <laughs> okay, I had to look, right? But I had the wherewithal to go, I don't know what the date is, I have it on my watch, my watch is on my wrist, I can look at it and go, it's the 24th. I say all the time to patients, what's the season? And they look out the window. If it's snowing, like it was a little while ago, and they go, it's summer, that's a lot more profound than if they go, oh, it's winter. <laughs> It's like, good on you for looking out the window and figuring that out, because you didn't know. That's perfectly okay for them to do. This is, so let's go back to, <laughs> it's not a trick. <laughs> We're not trying to trick anybody. Um, we really want them to do well on this. They want to do, we want them to succeed. So I, I tell them all the time, I'm gonna name three things. I want you to repeat them. I want you to remember them because I'm going to ask you about them later. Not a trick. Not a trick. You want them, you want them to succeed as much as possible. You just can't necessarily lead them. Okay? And the reason that we score it out of 30 is that it's very reproducible. We have patients, long-term patients in our clinic that started off with an MMSE of 28 and now they have an MMSE of 14 and we can serially track how they've declined. That's very helpful. So, okay, um, and remember this is a screen. This is not a diagnostic tool. Oh, you did badly on the MMSE, therefore you're demented. That doesn't happen. And I have people ask me that all the time because uh, most of the time people understand that they've just done kind of poorly on it, that it was a struggle for them, and they say, does that mean I have dementia? Does that mean I have Alzheimer's disease? and always reassure them this is just a screening tool so that we can help get as much information as possible to sort of sort out what's going on. This is not a diagnostic tool. This does not mean anything definitively. Right. So this is the number of languages that the MMSE is translated into. So if you get an MMSE in UK English, it's probably not going to say no ifs, ands, or buts. In fact, my big gripe with the MMSE, which is, by the way, copyrighted, is that they need to change that idiom because people don't know it anymore. Um, I don't know, uh, anybody in here speak Spanish? Okay, so there's an MMSE in Spanish in your packet. What does that one say? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, I'm asking questions. <laughs> No, no, no. Uh, so at the at the at the sort of the bottom of the page, there's something that says, um, re repeat, repeat after, after me. me. Okay. It's it is actually the same. Is it? It is says it? no ifs, ands, or buts? Oh. I mean, no, yeah. it's in Spanish, but it's a translation of that. Mm -hmm. Still thing? Oh, interesting. interesting. Somebody took that a little bit too easily. <laughs> um, okay. Mini mental state exam scored level by age and education. So you can actually look at this and figure out where your MMSE should be based on the number of education or years of education you have and how old you are, right? So if you're 65 years old and you've had a fourth grade education, an MMSE of 22 is probably normal. You're probably doing just fine, right? But an MMSE with more than 12 years of education should be 29. All right, that's because he wasn't wearing his watch and didn't know the date. <laughs> so it's really uh, important to find out what, what their education level is. Uh, as Annika said, if somebody's got a PhD, they need to know that they live in Cook County and Cook County's in Chicago, or, and, or Chicago's in Cook County and that we're in Illinois. They need to know that. There's two things a nursing home resident 
will never be able to answer is what time is it and what's the day and month. Right. Mm -hmm. Correct. That which is why, yeah. which is why, which days. is why, again, it's important for me to know what they missed. Because if I have a patient who's just gotten out of the hospital, one of the things that happens when I do the, the MMSE on a patient right after the turn of the month, right? It's March 1st, and I go, what's the month? And they go, it's February. Well, that's the answer they gave me. But I understand that they just didn't realize that it's just, it's a day later. These are people who don't have appointment calendars, largely speaking. They're retired. They don't have to make sure, they don't have to know what the date is, all right? And, and the passage from one month to the other, right there at that sort of turning point, is oftentimes where someone get, sort of trips up. So again, I, I give you a lot of slack for that. I do. But again, if you've got a master's degree, if you're an attorney and you can't spell world backwards, that, that's a problem, right? It's important what you miss. If you cannot write me a sentence when you're an educated, relatively well-educated person, that's problematic. Unless you're blind, didn't bring your glasses, have Parkinson's so bad that you can't write, again, that's all, um, that's why it's just a screen and not diagnostic. Okay. Um, one of the things we talk about um, uh, orientation. Um, one of my big pet peeves with the healthcare providers, the medical residents and medical students, we use uh, the term alert and oriented times three a lot in healthcare. Oriented times three means person, place, and time. And so I always ask the students, who, who is the person? And they say. Well, themselves, no. I want everybody to stop and think for just a minute. If you are so demented that you don't know who you are, we're not having any kind of meaningful communication at all. It's other. I don't care who the other person is. Who's a, who am I? Oh, you're that doctor person, because that's what they always call me. Or who are you, who's that? That's my daughter. Or who's that? That's you know, my cat, whatever. It's other person, right? So you have to be very careful about the information that we're gathering because it has to mean something. If they have some cognitive impairment, how can you rely on what they tell you as their educational level? <laughs> Good question. Good question. Most people, so remember that with most of the dementias, bless you, um, short-term memory is impaired yeah. first and most profoundly. Long-term memory stays intact very late into the game. And so one of the things that I'm doing when I'm taking a health history is I'm determining, as I'm asking all these questions, whether or not I can trust the historian. Sometimes I can, sometimes I put poor historian because I, I know that what I'm getting isn't necessarily the case. When I'm doing a review of systems, if I'm saying, how's your vision? I'm asking you. I'm not asking your daughter that's sitting next to you. I'm asking you. So if you're going, oh, my vision's fine, and she's going, have you had any falls in the last year? Oh, no, I never fall down on the daughter's like, Right? I know that there's a disconnect, which just leads me to want to do more testing. Um, clock drawing. So this one's great. This is actually super simple to do. Hand somebody a blank piece of paper, say draw a clock, put all the numbers in, and then I want you to put the hands in at 10 after 11. Easy peasy. All you need is a blank piece of paper. So, one point for the circle, one point for the numbers being in the right place, one point for it being uh, in the proper order, one point for the two hands, and for the correct time. A normal score is four or five points. So um, it can actually provide a lot of information about can you actually draw a circle, right? I tried to do this yesterday with a, with a new patient. I asked her to draw a clock for me. I said, draw a circle and put all the numbers in. And she drew the circle and she goes, well, now I don't understand. Um, so should I put letters in there? So what letters should I put in? And I said to her, are letters numbers? She said, well, sometimes. 
we didn't need to go any further, she was unable to do the clock draw. She was never going to be able to do that clock draw. But I got a lot of information in that very short conversation. Um, a normal clock drawing almost always predicts that a person has cognitive, cognitive abilities are within normal limits. There's a lot of stuff that you have to do to draw a clock. So, draw it in, put all of the numbers in, and they should be in the right place. Right? If you asked me to draw a clock, I'd draw the circle, I'd, I would put in 12, 6, 3, and 9 first, because those are my landmarks, and then I'd fill in the rest of them. Right? So I know how to do that because I'm cognitively intact. Then you want to have them put in the hands at 10 after 11. Think about what I just said, 10 after 11. I have to remember that 2 is 10 after. Right? Oftentimes that 10 gets over here. That, that, right? mm -hmm. And which one's the short hand and which one's the long hand? This is a complicated test. It's simple to do, simple to perform. Um, ask, to, ask someone to perform, but it gives you tons of information. They got all the numbers in. They would have gotten a point for that. They're not in the right place. They never got the hands in. That's interesting. So that, that shows an example, obviously, of someone showing the 10, because right. that's what they heard, so seeing the actual number 10. Right. That's why, uh, again, the way that you phrase it, 10 after 11, right? So you wouldn't say 1050 <laughs> if you wanted them to do 10 till. If somebody had a military career of some length that right. was in emergency services of right. some length, do you still use the same question? Sure. Okay. Because... If I say to you that I want you, I mean, like I wouldn't say 2300, <laughs> right? It's still 10 after 11. That one's interesting. There's no seven. They're all on the outside. Uh, it's a pretty interesting circle. And once again, um, the 10 and the 11. And, and when you, I mean, even, even if you're using like a little bit of a ski, that's still right where the nine should be. Not where the all them should be. Okay, so another real simple one: blank piece of paper. Animal naming instructions. Tell me the names of as many animals as you can think of as quickly as possible. You're going to time this in a minute. Pull out your watch, pull out your phone, and and time them. Um, I had the same patient yesterday. I asked her to do this, and she said, "Dog, cat." Um, we, we had the other, we, I, um, and I said, a horse is an animal. Uh-huh. There's, but, yeah, and she only got the two in a minute. She could only name those two. That was it. People are able to use all kinds of animals. So you could say, dog. Dalmatian, um, uh, Schnauzer, Great Dane, those all count. But if you say dog, puppy, no. Cat, kitten, no. Horse, pony, no. But you could say horse, Clydesdale, Arabian, you know, those kinds of things. Because you can fall into that really easy. You can go cat, tiger, you know, lion, ocelot, puma, cougar, you know, those, that's perfectly legit. So you ask people to speak this, not write it? Yep, okay. just name them. Okay. I usually write them down just so I can okay. kind of keep track of them. Sometimes I just, if they're going really fast, I'll just put a hash mark on a piece of paper with the number that they do. And it just says, right, just exactly what I said. So you could even say, bugs. So, yeah. The same animal, the different animal set of stages, lamb and sheep, puppy and dog. <laughs> um, if it's less than 14, you probably should be looking at further testing. I mean, 14 animals in, 15, in, a, in a full minute, that's a long time to spend. It's just only coming up with 14. 
Um, that's kind of all I wanted to do, was just kind of give you an introduction to some of this stuff. And I wanted this to be as interactive as possible, but then she shut me down. <laughs> but I do want you guys to be able to ask as many questions as you need to. Um, any concerns you have about having somebody in front of you? And So is this the, the uh, an attorney who works with developers and is developing plant power of attorney who makes <coughs> the will? Is this the ethical steps they have to go through to determine their capacity? Where'd she go? <laughs> <laughs> um, so we are, in terms of ADAPT, um, working with Susie who heads up our client support services, um, she's drafting a protocol for what do you do if you're meeting with a client and you're concerned that they might not have capacity um, to understand the documents, to execute the documents. Um, so for now, we're working on a case-by-case -case basis, and if you are meeting with a client and just think, I I'm not sure if this person really understands what we're talking about, what these documents mean, um, we're asking the volunteer attorney to contact whoever is on backup that day. Um, we've got instructions in the orientation materials about how to do that out of earshot of, of the client if that's appropriate, um, and sort of give us some more information about what's going on, what your concerns are, um, to talk it through with another person, and then likely what we would do if, if we did have concerns is have the client come back on another day, um, have someone with, with client support services meet with the client along with us to decide what to do going forward. So this is going to be used mostly for drafting documents to know if they have the right. to sign. Right. Right. To, to know, um, do they understand what this document is? Um, not to be able to explain the legal terms in it, because that's our job, but do they understand, Do they are, are they capable of understanding what it is once an attorney sort of goes through it with them? Um, do they understand the implications of the document? What does it mean to have this? Um, do they uh, understand who they've appointed, what that person's powers will be after having the document? I came in late, a minute late, but so we're all going to use this as screening even if we don't have any concerns? No, 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 oh, no, 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 no. It's only going to be used if we have concerns and someone else might have been It, it, this might be part of what the protocol ends up being, um, but I, we, we wouldn't want you to just give this to someone without talking to a staff person first. So I guess the first step is if, if you have a concern about a client's capacity to sign the documents, talk to whoever the backup person at LAF is and we'll sort of say, Let's talk to client support services to see if maybe we should administer a mini mental status exam, or this person just so clearly doesn't have capacity. Um, we don't need to delve into that. That's something we'll work with Susie on deciding when and whether to use these tools on clients. But I think I think part of this was just to expose you to yeah. mm -hmm. how you can. I mean, you don't have to go through an entire MMSE to determine whether someone's got capacity. You can. You can sort of incorporate this into just into a, a, a normal line of questioning that you would new, would do with any client that you were preparing documents for. Um, you know, I think that um, uh, capacity in, with the ADAPT program is, is so important because in the number of patients that I have who don't have advanced directives um, and who don't because they don't understand what they are, when they hear things like power of attorney, they're like, I can't afford a lawyer, right? And I explain to them that they don't need one. Uh, when I explain to them what uh, a power of attorney is supposed to be, um, I often have to, again, address that more than once because the daughter says, I'm the power of attorney, give me all the information. It's like, you know, your mother's alert and oriented and she's perfectly cognitively intact and able to make her own decisions, so none of this is any of your business. They don't understand that either. But I signed the paper. The daughter doesn't understand. The daughter doesn't understand. <laughs> um, the family member, I mean, the patient, if the patient tells me, you can tell her anything you want to, I'm going to tell her anything I want to. Mm -hmm. But um, I've actually had patients pull me aside and say, please don't tell my daughter. Mm -hmm. Please don't tell my son. It's like it's none of their business at this point. The daughter was in their, in their company as they come in. Exactly. Mm -hmm. The other part of that, though, is 
when I actually have patients who have power of attorney. Oh, my daughter's the power of attorney. What have you told her? What do you mean? Well, well, well what do you want done and don't want done? Oh, she'll know. I'm like, no, she don't. She won't. She's not a mind reader. You have to tell her. You have to explain to her. I have had situations where I've had a patient say to me, I do not want to be intubated. If I go, I just want you to let me <coughs> die. And the daughter says, well, I couldn't possibly let that happen. Then she can't be your power of attorney. You have to choose somebody else. Choose the mailman. I don't care, but someone who will carry out your wishes. It's not okay to, 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 to have someone your, be your power of attorney who won't listen to what you want and won't, listen, won't do what you want. Right? So I'm constantly having to assess that, but if I've got a patient who doesn't have the capacity to understand what all that means, who doesn't understand that, that they're going to die one day um, and there are things that we are going to do to them if we don't have uh, paperwork in place, um, then that becomes problematic. Um, with, I'll tell another story, the, with the medical residents, um, all the time when they start talking about do not resuscitate orders and that kind of thing, they, everybody wants to soft sell this. Nobody wants to talk about death. Nobody wants to talk about well, the pain and suffering you go through when you're, when you're doing it wrong. <laughs> um, uh, and so they'll go, oh, now, okay. If you should have trouble breathing, and I go, stop right there. What's the only answer to that question? If I'm having trouble breathing, yes, I want you to help me. <laughs> How about this? If you die, do you want me to try and bring you back to life? Oh, honey, I'm 89. Let me go. Sign here. <laughs> it doesn't have to be that complicated, but I need to make sure that they understand. And if they don't understand, I can talk from now until the cows come home, and it's still not going to make any difference. Yes? Um, <laughs> frequently, for the clients coming in for these appointments, not always, but a lot of times our clients will bring someone with them to the appointment. Um, Sometimes the person they want to be their agent, but sometimes just a family member because they've been relying on a family member, a spouse, whoever, um, for lots of help. And so um, at least at the beginning of the appointment, it's really important that we meet with the client alone first, um, first to just go over um, confidentiality, to make sure this person is not exerting undue influence, all kinds of lawyer things. Right. Um, and so I wonder if, I'm sure you do have opinions about assessing someone's capacity. Uh, it sounds like sometimes a, a loved one can be helpful in the room as you're assessing out capacity, but um, are there things that are important to go over in that beginning part of the appointment when we've got the client alone without the, the family member in the room? You know, I think it's perfectly legitimate to say, how's your memory? Most people are pretty honest about it. It's not that great. I'm not, you know, what kind of things do you forget? Oh, yeah, I forget appointments if I don't write them down. Okay, but if you write them down, do you remember them? Oh, yeah, I have a calendar I look at every day. Okay, then you're probably good to go, right? I tell patients all the time, it isn't important that you're like, where are my keys? It's more important to me if you go, what are these? Right? So that's what you want to just try to do, a real basic assessment. Quite frankly, um, you know, I'll tell you the same thing that when we... The, the little cards that some of you picked up, um, Rush, the American Bar Association and the American Psychiatric Association put together uh, an online um, uh, training program in capacity, and that's what's sort of a summary in, those, in that little little card thing. And you can actually take the online course; it's great, um, uh, and I encourage you to do that. Um, it doesn't cost that much money, I don't think. Um, uh, but one of the things that I fought really hard when we were putting that together is that I think that we should including all of the people in the room, be assessing capacity every encounter all the time. I do that from the minute somebody walks into my, cl my clinic. Like, do they have the capacity to understand what I'm talking about? Because if they don't, I need to find somebody who does. Right? I, can't, I can't give them a page full of instructions and have them go off and expect them to take care of the, the business that I want them to take care of if they don't understand a thing about what I'm saying. So capacity is, it, assessing capacity is an ongoing, never-ending um, function in what we do if we're going to do what we do right. Mm -hmm. So I have an example, and maybe you can, you can place what, you know. Uh, I have a client who has lived by dementia. She wanted to dissolve her marriage, hired an attorney, signed contracts, and 
Mr. Retainer. The facility amended SCCP 211 determined that she doesn't have decision making capacity. And so now there's a question about whether she can continue with these divorce proceedings. You know, is, is a document valid if, until it's been adjudicated that this person doesn't have decision making capabilities? So if the attorney who entered into these contracts with her can tell you that she actually understood what was going on, she actually made that decision based on the information, just like we talked about in that first slide, then she had the capacity at that moment to make that contract, and so the contract is valid. Yeah, but we've, you know, my, my knowledge is that once that CCP is in place, that she shouldn't that, sign anything from that date. From forward. that time forward, no, yeah. not until you get so before. Even her decision making capacity may have been exactly the same when she signed these documents, Correct. because she hadn't had an exam done at that point. Correct. Yeah. Right. And, and, and I'm, I, I don't know if you, how many people in the room have actually seen CP, CCP 211s? I'm not sure that everyone will know what that is. Okay. Can you, yeah. No, okay. definitely won't, because I don't. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it, uh, the C, it, it's, that's just simply the number of the form. CCP 211, if you put it into Google, it'll pull up the CCP 211 in Illinois, which is basically uh, a physician statement saying this person doesn't have decision-making capacity. And it's frequently used in guardianship proceedings. Correct. Right? Yeah. It's, it's, it was always going to be the first step in the guardianship proceedings. <clears throat> and physicians are awful about filling them out. They fill them out really, really badly. Um, and then they have to get uh, on in front of a judge and and defend it, and it's often indefensible because they do it such a they do such a bad job of filling them out. Um, That's the form number on the, on the right. It's just the number of the form CCP two eleven. I, I can't remember the actual title of the document, but but yeah. Physicians report, I think, is yeah, what it's always referred to. Right. So um, and 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 I don't know that you're aware that that more and more judges are just really loath to give guardianship to anybody for unless it's there's a real profound um, deficit and so what they're doing is they're doing um, partial guardianship mm -hmm. right and awarding can, guardianship of the person for example and not of the estate right it's a lot harder to get guardianship of the estate for obvious reason so um, and putting in stipulations just like you mentioned earlier um, this person can make a grocery list, go to the store, buy their groceries. They can, um, you know, go out pay to their, eat, right, pay, their, pay their bills. Yeah. They can go to the movies. They can go to the theater, but they cannot sell their house. It's it's good to hear that you guys are seeing that because this the statute was um, changed to say that to the extent possible, guardianships should be limited instead of plenary, instead right. of just you have broad guardianship. Right. Um, so yeah, if doing that, that's good. Right. Because I mean, it used to be when with plenary guardianship, you've just taken away an entire person's personhood. Just, if you've got the wrong guardian, they can dictate to you what you can wear and not wear for clothing. Are these doctors who are appointed by the court? Or so, uh, someone who's filling out a CCP two eleven is not appointed by the court. So, this is someone who is. either experiencing a patient who clearly doesn't have capacity and something needs, somebody needs to intervene, right? Decisions need to be made. This person cannot make them. I, therefore, guardianship must be sought, right? Um, in in, uh, in a, a hospital situation, it might be um, a public guardian because there isn't anybody else to, to step up. It is um, not necessarily someone who is in an established uh, physician-patient relationship with the person. Nope, not necessarily. So the ethics of the medical profession aren't necessarily triggered at that level. It's a third. It's a. It's a person who's a stranger. A, a physician is a stranger to this it, particular it, patient. It could be. It could be. And like I said, if someone is just simply hospitalized. Right, mm -hmm. and they have a broken leg, and they don't want their leg set, and they want to get up and walk out of the hospital, um, and it's clear that they're delirious, and it's clear that they're not making sense, and it's clear that they're not making um, a, a decision that they actually fully understand. But I'm the ER physician, and I've met the guy 20 minutes ago. I can be filling out that CCP to 11 because mm -hmm. somebody needs to step in and intervene. Oftentimes, it is the um, primary care provider who is. Who does have an established relationship? So who can either. right? Who can actually say we've you know we have actually tested this person. We have actually we have documented time after time after time that there's a decision making uh, deficit. Mm -hmm. right. 
the, the physician has to have examined the patient within the last 90 days, and then the guardianship petition has to be filed within 90 days of that examination for the CCP 211 to be considered. Um, and when Dan mentioned that some of the CCP 211s are, you know, put, filled out, you know, not, not very well at all, right. more frequently you're going to see that, it, like a physician in the ED who had no idea who this person was, examine them for 20 minutes, say, right. you know, our, when we are asked to do them, which we're asked to do them fairly frequently, right. typically we have quite a bit more data where, and our physicians will go back and look at, you know, quite a few exam notes and kind of see what's been going on and fill it out, you know, how they were in the last, the last time they saw them. Um, mm -hmm. But we're obviously in a position where we can fill them out um, and give a lot more detail and evidence um, to sort of back up the, the claim that which, someone might need that. Which might show a lot more chronicity. Um, remember what I said at the beginning, um, uh, lots of things affect decisional capacity, like the fact that I'm in great pain because my leg is sticking, you know, I have a broken leg and I'm not making very good decisions, but once you actually give me something for pain, you set my leg, I come well, exactly out of the right. pain so medication. How could a physician who's a stranger to the particular patient right. uh, do a spontaneous CCP 211 uh, uh, it's, it's, a person who's under some mild sedation or right. something? Right, so it's uh, it's rare that they're going to do something. It's uh, preposterous, actually. Uh, <laughs> yeah, right. It's, something, it's rare that they're going to do something precipitous. I mean, they're going to they're gonna wait to see if the delirium clears. They're going to wait to see... Um, if they can reason with somebody. We have patients who leave against medical advice all the time because we let them, and we let them go because we feel that they have the capacity sure. to make that decision. Like I said, it's not about making the decision I want you to make, it's about whether or not you understand the decision that you're making. Um, and so, you know, physicians aren't gonna just go, oh yeah, I don't like the way that guy looks. I feel like, <laughs> take away his And we get requests from family members who are initiating the guardianship uh, petition yeah. to do them all the time, and we look at them like they're crazy. Right. They, they're we just look upset at that the that their parent doesn't want to do what they want to do. So right. their parent doesn't want to go to a nursing home. They right. file for guardianship. It happens all the time. And our right. physicians, in that case, say th that you you know your mom doesn't need a guardian. We're not right. completing these forms, or we'll complete them and we'll state that they have capacity and they can make decisions right. for themselves. They can make decisions. So it will be dismissed, themselves. obviously. Is there um, a similar form to undo it if it was a temporary? So, it, so first of all, uh, when you're, uh, no matter if, if, first thing they'll do is they'll appoint a guardian ad litem before they actually do anything permanent at all. Um, okay. And and even if they, even if you've got a plenary guardian, you're going to need to go before the court on a regular basis mm -hmm. to make sure that you're doing the things you're supposed to do and that the patient still requires guardianship. Um. We, so we haven't had any appointments with interpreters yet, right. but at, at some point we will. Do you have experience with assessing people's capacity through an interpreter and any um, differences or things that you need to be aware of when you're well, it's actually, an extra layer of... It's often actually sometimes very... It's often easier with some interpreters because they will be like, just a minute, I, I don't understand what they're trying to tell me. And they'll say something I'm like, it, well, that doesn't really make a lot of sense. They're telling me that, you know, um, the moon is out and, and, and the dog is a cat, like whatever. I mean, they'll, they'll actually tell you what the patient has, or the, the client has said. And, in, and an interpreter is supposed to be doing that. They're supposed to be saying, this is what they're saying, not this is how I am interpreting what they're saying and feeding it back to you, which is what happens with family members. Because what they meant to say was that they try to pay their bills on time, but they forget sometimes. That's what the daughter is going to tell you, but the interpreter is going to say exactly what the patient said. So sometimes it's much clearer and much easier to uh, determine that someone has got cognitive impairment. That's a, that actually will be important, I think, to note to volunteers that in these cases, then it's especially important to we, because of attorney-client issues, we right. always, always try to get a professional interpreter and not yeah. some yes. some person that came to the appointment. But here, that'll be especially important for assessing capacity. Mm -hmm. um, and what so as a like a when you're talking to a client through an interpreter, as opposed to uh, speaking with a client in your native language, uh -huh. are there things to be wary of or look out for there? Are there things that sort of get lost in translation sometimes as you're trying to assess capacity? Things get lost in translations with me a lot because I, I do 
tend to speak idiomatically. <laughs> and I try really hard not to do that when I'm with a, uh, someone who, uh, uh, again, with the Chinese, when I have to be pretty concrete. Mm -hmm. um, so I try not to make jokes, and I try not to um, uh, make references that they may not understand. Because, again, the interpreter is not there to, to chastise me. <laughs> They're not there to... Uh, to sort of correct me when I'm when I'm not speaking clearly or directly, they're just going to simply say to the, the client what I'm saying to the client. Um, but doing things like maintaining eye contact and trying to talk to the patient or the client rather than to the interpreter, uh, you know, instead of saying, "Can you ask her?" I just look right at the client and talk to the client um, and leave it up to the interpreter. Um, uh, when you're doing something like an MMSC, where you do have some uh, idiom that's in there already, and you don't have one in, sp in Chinese or whatever language you're having, you might want to try something like the clock drawing or the animal naming instead, simply because that will give you, uh, I mean, everybody knows what a clock is. Mm -hmm. No one, and no one has ever yet, whenever I've asked them to do a clock drawing, no one ever has ever yet drawn a rectangle mm -hmm. and put in, <laughs> right? <laughs> Like 11, 10. <laughs> never. <laughs> a digital clock has never been drawn. Yes? <laughs> I would, I, to raise a simple, another point, though, I mean, I've worked with um, older adults who were not familiar with clocks, as an example. So there's the language issue, but then there's also the cultural issue. And sure. so taking responsibility for doing your homework about the cultural background and the context mm -hmm. for the individual who you know, may have never used a clock in their life, maybe illiterate, and it wasn't within their culture to use one. So right. asking them to draw a clock, and if they got it wrong, um, knowing why they got it wrong, it wasn't because Correct. of lack of capacity, but because Every, it everything's wasn't about context. Used. Everything's about yeah. context. It's exactly like I, I said, why I keep saying that, the, that all this stuff is just a screen, right? The MMSC is just a screen. If you, if, if you can't, if you don't know how to spell world forward, you're not going to be able to spell it backwards. Right? So I'm not going to ding you for that. I just need to know. I just want to gather the information. Part of this is just actually chatting with the, with the, with the patient, mm -hmm. learning more and more about how much sense are they making. Right? Um, the number of times where I will sit down and, and talk with a patient about that comes in with a complaint. Right? The reason that they have scheduled the appointment, when they call up to schedule the appointment, they're always asked, why are you coming in? Oh, I hurt my left knee. So I walk into the room knowing they have pain in their left knee. So I sit down and I go, how is the pain in your left knee? No, I don't. I go, how are you? What's going on? What brings you in today? Oh, well, um, you know, I, uh, I cut my finger. When did that happen? Oh, gee, I, I don't know. Right? So clearly, there's something that's not quite right. Um, when the story changes in the middle of the uh, recitation, something's not right. It doesn't make any, I don't have to do, I mean, there's a whole lot of patients I don't have to do an MMSC on. I do it so that it's documented, it's in the chart, and I can then compare it later on. It's a good tool to have. It's often not required at all for me to determine that someone has got dementia, that they have Alzheimer's dementia as opposed to a frontal temporal dementia. Um, you know, I, I don't I don't necessarily need this to, to 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 understand that the person in front of me is having issues. It's just like it's just a tool like anything else. Um, in terms of administering the MMSE, I yes. mean like there's legal information all over the place, but if you're not a lawyer you're not supposed to give out legal advice. So right. are there any sort of recommendations or limitations on really who should be um, allowed to use this tool? No, actually um, I think that the, the person who's allowed to use the tool is someone who's actually gotten a little bit little bit of training. This was a little bit of training <laughs> to do it, right? To know it's not a trick, to know that you're not trying to trap somebody. This is not a gotcha moment. Um, to understand what each of those domains is asking and how to ask it. In fact, I will tell you that I don't, one of the things that annoys me about um, our MMSE under the orientation so it all comes down, mm -hmm. so when you have state, county, city, hospital, floor, right? So what I ask is year, season, month, date, and day. That's how I ask it. 
because again, it's not a trick, and it actually flows much better for me to for someone to go. It's 2016. It's winter. It's February. <laughs> here's the date. Here's the day of the week. It's not a trick. I'm not trying to trick anybody. I don't want to got. I don't, I don't want this to be a gotcha for anything. So as long as you're aware that that's what you're doing and why you're doing it, do they know where they are in the world? Do they know when they are in the world? Right? Can they take in basic information? Can they register what I'm saying to them? And can they recall it in a minute? So that's the reason that it's set up the way that it is. You ask the person, I want, I want to name these things and I want you to remember them because I'm going to ask you about them later. And then what you do is you distract them with attention and calculation by saying, do this other task because I want some time to pass before I ask you the recall because I've given you very specific instructions. You need to remember these things because I'm going to ask you about them in a minute. And then a minute later, if they can't recall them, and oftentimes they're like, what, what? And like I said, if someone is cognitively impaired, almost invariably they're going to go, world. <laughs> no, world isn't the one of the three things. Um, and, and I will prompt. So if I go, what were the three things that I asked you to remember? And they're like, oh. Um, And we'll often go ball, and they'll go ball, flag, tree, right? So they may very well do that. And I'll give them two points. It's not a trick. Yes? How long does it take you to administer the task? It's really, that one takes a couple of minutes. It really doesn't take that long. Mm -hmm. If it's starting to take a really long time, yeah, probably ought to wrap it up. <laughs> I mean, seriously, if, they, if they're struggling with it that much, you've got your answer. Right. You don't need to power through when someone right. is just You don't have to bludgeon them. Yeah. Because it'll be a negative experience for them, obviously. You've gotten enough information if the first, you know, ten questions were a complete struggle. Right. Or, you know, you get a lot of people that are quite confident. Can you tell me what year this is? Of course I can. It's 1974. Really? 1974? I mean, sometimes you get 1916, because so 2016, 1916. But you know, 1970, like, okay. <laughs> Oftentimes, if they have one of those relatives with them, I'm like, who's that? Oh, it's my sister. It's not my sister. It's her daughter. We're done. We don't have to go any further. I've got my answer. I don't need to. Right. This isn't about being mean. <laughs> it isn't about humiliating someone. The whole point is, do you think, as the person that wants to um, execute documents, do you think this patient has capacity? And if you don't, stop. Doesn't mean they can't get the uh, documents executed. It just means you need more information before you can continue. Right. Careful about people that are socially appropriate. I had a patient, 90 years old, a great guy. Um, I saw him once, uh, did a history and physical on him. Uh, his son lived in California. I called up the son and I said, you know, I'm really concerned because I think your father is pretty cognitively impaired. Oh, no, he's fine. He's fine. Well, you know, I'm concerned because he's still driving. Oh, yeah, but he just drives to the store and back. Right? I'm concerned because he lives alone. Yeah, but he's got a housekeeper that comes in a couple of times a week. Well, I'm still concerned. So time goes on. He comes back in. Every time he would come into the clinic, I would call the son and be like, <laughs> and the son was always like, oh, poo poo, it's all fine, right? So I saw him once, he, had, he was in the park, he fell, broke his wrist in the middle of winter, flipped on some ice, broke his wrist, was in a cast for six weeks. I saw him two weeks after he got the cast off, he came into the clinic, I'm like, how's your arm? He goes, why are you asking me about my arm? I said, well, because you broke it. Don't be stupid, I've never broken my arm in my life. Mm -hmm. Call the son up, I'm really concerned, this is really a problem. So the son finally flew in from California. Now you have to understand this guy was incredibly, the 90 year old was incredibly socially, socially appropriate. He was really a hail fellow well met. He was a nice guy to talk to. He was charming, right? He would try to pick up the ladies in the waiting room. He really would, <laughs> <laughs> truly would. And uh, so the son finally flew in from California and he kind of looked at the situation and he goes, well, you know, I'm gonna move him into an assisted living facility. Well. This guy was like, talk about landing in a pot of jam. The women out never the men ate to one. He was having the time of his life. 
And so the son got him all settled in, and he was getting ready to head back out of town. And he gave me he gave me a call. And he goes, you know, I don't know. I don't know that Dad's very demented. I mean, he's still doing the crossword puzzle. And I said to him, well, doctor, because he was a physician, you understand that with dementia, long-term memory stays intact very late into the game. Your father's been doing crossword puzzles his entire life. My guess is he'll continue to do that. But this physician couldn't see the dementia in his father. Now, part of that, I believe, is denial is a wonderful thing. <laughs> As long as he, so here's the thing, he called his father every Sunday at 4 o'clock. And every Sunday at 4 o'clock, his father was sitting in his living room next to the phone. There wasn't the television on. There was no interruptions going on. And he talked a really good game, right? Oh, I'm doing fine. Yeah, I went for a drive the other day. I went grocery shopping. Then I met the boys for lunch, and we had a really wonderful time. And then I went for a walk in the park. Who knows how much of it happened, if any of that but it sounded perfectly plausible. He was a charming man to talk to, and he talked in complete sentences, and there was nothing alarming. And so the son didn't have to take any action. Because once you acknowledge that your loved one, your family member, is demented, you can't just go, ah. Oh. Right? You gotta take some kind of an action. And that's a very difficult thing for family members to do. They have to now step up and, and say to their, their parent, you have to move. Or I think it's time for you to sell the house that you live in and move into a nursing home? No, Mom, it's not a nursing home. It's an assisted living facility. It's a nursing home! <laughs> no, Mom, you'll really like it there. No, I'm not moving. Right? That opens up a whole can of worms. So you have to watch for those people that, are, that appear to be very cognitively intact. And when you just scratch the surface a little bit, you find out that Ooh, maybe something's not quite right there. That's why talking about um, those, those decisional steps, right? Do you understand what I'm saying? I want you to fill out a power of attorney. Tell me what that means to you. You know, I want to make sure that you understood what we talked about, so I want you to sort of give me a recap about what we just talked about. Oh, you want me to fill out a form naming someone who's going to make decisions for me in the, in the situation where I can't make them for myself. And I've decided that my daughter's going to do it, and I'm going to talk to my daughter and I'll let her know exactly what it is I want done and not done. So I you. <laughs> if they look at you and they go, well, I, I really don't understand, it's like, well, but I just spent the last 45 minutes explaining it to you, you've got your answer. Hmm? Um. We, so, in these appointments, we're going to be having a briefer conversation with the client on the phone to sort mm -hmm. of explain what this project is, what documents we're offering, are you interested, if so, we'll set you for an appointment to come in, and then um, the client will hopefully um, be here one time for an hour and a half and go through the documents, get all kinds of advice, make their choices um, on which documents they want, what they want in them, sign them, execute them, go home. Um, so to avoid being sort of blindsided mm -hmm. by a client who gets set for an appointment and you're meeting with them and it becomes clear that they really don't have capacity, um, and I hate to put you on the spot, so mm -hmm. if you're not sure of an answer now, that's fine, um, but do you have a good quick screening tool um, that we could ask, we could talk to clients about something on the phone um, to suss out like potential capacity issues? Um, and also, you know, when people come to you, they're expecting to, be, to get these sorts of examinations. Right. With us, they're like, well, like, you guys are lawyers, right? You know, so um, maybe also some ways to approach it that aren't going to totally throw the client off mm -hmm. um, to normalize and mm -hmm. make sure they understand we just ask this to everyone. Well, I mean, that's exactly the thing to do. It's like I, I've given MMSEs to 65-year-olds that I know are absolutely cognitively intact. I need to dot the I's, I need to cross the T's. I'm going to do a mini mental state exam on you. I'm going to do a geriatric depression scale on you because we do that for all new patients. We do this for all new patients. And they laugh. Really? You're asking me this? <laughs> right, the same way we yes. ask clients, do you have any assets, you know, over $10,000? And people laugh unless right. they're homeowners. So they say, well, yeah. I have a house that I inherited. Right. Yeah. So, um, so when you're on the phone with somebody, simply asking if they have advanced directives. You know what I mean? Because they'll probably go, 
uh, what? <laughs> what are those? And so you can just by exploring what an advanced directive is and why they would be coming in, they should be able to give you a pretty good clue as to whether or not they understand anything about what you're saying. So maybe just to ask a couple of open-ended questions and right. make sure they can give rational answers. Right, exactly. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, they don't have to, you just, this doesn't have to be a tell me all about your life kind of a thing. Just mm -hmm. a couple of things that can, can they put a sentence together? Do they understand what, what they're saying? Because <laughs> mm -hmm. oftentimes my patients don't understand what they're saying themselves. Any more questions? We did it. We filled the whole hour now. So, I'll just say I love it when um, my brother will call up and say, "Well, Rob, you know, Dad's made a bad decision about X, Y, Z." Right. And I'll say, "Well, we all make bad decisions." Right. And he goes. Cut out the ombudsman crap. This is your dad. I'm not a client. I, say, I have the same values, Mark. You know, I, I tell I patients. I remind him that he didn't treat his diabetes for 25 years, and then two summers ago came within a night of dying, right. and we had to fly out there to see him. Right. Oh, well, yeah, that was 25 years of not making good decisions, Mark. Right. Right. There was a culmination there, but yeah. Yeah. So, I, you know, one of the things that we run into all the time is. It's flu season, and so we're constantly trying to get people to take a flu vaccine. And they're like, well, I don't take flu vaccines. And I look at people right in the eye and go, okay, that's fine. But if you die of, if you die of the flu, I'm going to put on your gravestone that you died of stupid. <laughs> right? It's perfectly okay for me to have an opinion. <laughs> but I don't, I don't then wrestle them to the ground and give them a flu shot. I just document that they've refused it. But I also let them know. I mean, I tell family members all the time, well, you have to make my mother do this. It's like, you know, honey, the day I cure stupid, they'll give me the Nobel Prize. <laughs> <laughs> it can be a stupid decision in my opinion. It just has to be one that's actually got something behind it. I don't want to have a flu shot because I saw on Dr. Phil that it's going to give me autism. <laughs> all right, so you actually understand why you're not going to do it. You actually understand um, the reasoning behind it, you've made your choice. It's a dumb choice in my opinion, but that's just, again, my opinion. No. It's, not the, it's not the decision, it's the, the, it's the uh, um, process, not the decision itself. So, um, uh, she has name and number, my, you know, my name and number, please don't inundate me, but <laughs> if you have questions, if you want to email me or give me a call or whatever, I'm happy to I'm happy to help. Um, do you have any other questions? Thank you so much for coming. <laughs>